so it's great to talk to everybody today. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is how we've used InnerSource to fundamentally change and improve our Watson AI technology. And the new stack that we have is something that we call Watson Core, which you can think of as the third generation of uh, Watson AI technology. Uh, so to put this into context, the early days of AI at IBM in the industry were much more promised than actual reality. So until about 2010, there was a joke that AI was always perpetually 10 years from being useful. This culminated around 2010, 2011 as advancements in cloud computing, the explosion of data, and AI algorithms led to things like IBM's Watson Jeopardy computer, Siri, uh, advancements in deep learning and smashing benchmarks. This caused a great deal of interest in using AI in real world scenarios. And for IBM, this meant taking our Watson Jeopardy system and starting to bring it to business. And so that meant that we started new divisions around industry verticals, we bought AI companies, and we started some new products. And I think of this as the apps and API era, where we were really starting to have a set of applications that used AI, and also we provided developer APIs to make AI more accessible. But this was also characterized internally by a tremendous amount of technical fragmentation. Watson was more of a label than a tech stack. Then in 2018, IBM bought Red Hat, and we started down a new strategy that we called the hybrid cloud and AI strategy. And that's where I enter the picture. So uh, in the 2010s, one of my main jobs at IBM was to transform our in internal development. And one of the ways that manifested itself is that we did this massive centralized deployment of GitHub Enterprise, Slack, and Travis CI, because before that, IBM development had been tremendously fragmented, so it was hard for people even to physically work together, let alone all the cultural and process inhibitors to working together. So in 2019, I switched over to, to be in charge of the, the Watson technology stack. And the reason for that was, even though I didn't have an AI background, the goal was to actually make AI a ubiquitously adopted technology across the IBM product suite. Before that, it was only about maybe 10 or 12 products that seriously used AI. And there were two goals. The first one was to differentiate our own products with AI. But then the second one was that our own product should act as a reference that this Watson stuff is actually good as a platform technology. What I found in 2019 was there were two massive inhibitors. And I'm sure for folks who are on an inner source call, these might not surprise you. So the first one was that each division was doing AI. My assumption was that no one was doing AI, but in fact, everybody was, but in their own way because of siloing, Conway's law, et cetera. The second thing was more of a technical problem, which was in the 2010s, we were really focused on the IBM public cloud, but now moving to a hybrid cloud approach, our stuff had to run anywhere. So we needed portability, which we didn't have. The way we made progress on this was a project we started in 2019 called Watson NLP. So if you're not familiar with the acronym NLP, it stands for natural language processing. And it's basically using computers to understand human language, like you're hearing right now, or that might be in text. And natural language processing is one of the areas where it's too complex for traditional programming. So it's been a real sweet spot for AI going back 20, 30 years. And so this chart here by my colleague, Laura Kitikaru, who's our distinguished engineer for natural language at IBM, shows IBM investments in natural language from about 1990 to 2016. You don't have to read everything on the chart. The thing to take away from it is that we've been at NLP for a long time. We've made a tremendous amount of investments, but the lines don't converge. So in 2019, we established a goal that we should get to a common NLP stack for the company. And we wanted the picture to go from something like this to something like this, where all of our investments were funneling into a common stack. And then all of the, um, or the common stack was being picked up by many different IBM products. We didn't know how to do this at first. And we were trying to puzzle about how do we get from fragmentation to commonality. And I'm guess, guessing the folks on this call know the punchline to it. Somebody in the room said, the only way you can get two IBM teams to work together is in open source. And because Watson had started from such a proprietary starting point, just jumping to open source wasn't a possibility. And that's how we discovered InnerSource and InnerSource Commons as a kind of a real inspiration and set of learning about how we could get people to work together inside of IBM. So this is how I pitched InnerSource inside of IBM. And of course, I don't have to explain this to you folks, but the way we pitched it within IBM was that we needed a robust foundation because creating world-class NLP is hard to do. And this would free up the product teams to actually have their developers rather than creating their own kind of half-assed NLP to actually work on differentiating product features. And then finally, growing a really great community inside of IBM 
which frankly we didn't have, even though we had had, we'd done the work to have a common GitHub enterprise system, you didn't see cross divisional collaborations that only happened within divisional boundaries. So in the first year with Watson NLP, it was very successful. And the reason it was successful is because we really tried to embrace doing inner source right. I'm sure everybody here on the call has an experience about seeing something like agile or DevOps or inner source done wrong. And so we really embraced the patterns of inner source commons. Um, we interacted with the community and in inner source commons to learn from all of the great lessons that people had already learned. And the people you might have seen in the Slack were people like Olivia Bujek and Michaela Eller, who were our real leaders pioneering this at IBM. And what we saw in the first year is we were able to get to 700 users, so people inside IBM who were considering using NLP or using NLP, 12 full-time maintainers who were staffed across different divisions from the software divisions to IBM Research, and then finally being able to facil facilitate 50 different contributors making one-off or two-off contributions into the stack because it basically helped unblock their adoption of Watson NLP. In the first year, we saw 16 product adoptions. We saw a 75% decrease in time to value. I can go into the way we calculated that if you like, but if anything, it's, it's not as aggressive as it could be. And we saw um, velocity increase in all of our products that used NLP. The Coda to the NLP story, in July last year, Steve Lohr of the New York Times, their technology writer, wrote an article called Whatever Happened to IBM's Watson and was looking back at the first 10 years of Watson and talking about some of the overpromising, the hits, the misses. But at the end of the article, they contracted a guy named Oret Oren Etzioni, who's a very famous AI guy to evaluate quote unquote Watson. And we got really lucky because what he evaluated was our natural language tech. And by this point, all of our commercial products had been rebased on this common stack that was developed with InnerSource. And so what he found was our natural language stack was as good or better than Amazon, Microsoft, or Google. And so what this said to us internally is if we can work together, we can literally create world-class AI technology that's as good or better than anybody's. So then the thought became, if we can make this work for NLP, why shouldn't we be able to make this work for any AI uh, in support of this goal of making AI ubiquitous part of our software portfolio? And so at this point, we'd been working on AI applications for about 10 years since the Watson Jeopardy system. So we looked at all those applications and step one on the right here was, what are the things that everybody ends up building? So we didn't want to invent platform components from scratch. We wanted to identify where things were being created in a redundant manner. The second thing was to select the best starting points from IBM and from open source. Um, so we didn't want to start from scratch. We wanted to harvest the best implementations and pull them into the common architecture. And then finally, activate inner source and open source ecosystems so that we can actually coalesce the investments and innovations. So this shows where we've gotten to now. So the primary inputs and upstreams are IBM Research, strategic open source, and then contributions from other products into the common stack which flows out into IBM products and ISVs. I'll just take a second to show that stack. So this is the stack as it exists today. There's kind of a common runtime with trustworthy AI at its core, and then a set of algorithmic libraries that correspond to kind of normal AI use cases like NLP, chat, time series, et cetera. Um, it's far beyond the scope of this discussion to get into the stack, but what I will say is um, we intend to open source large chunks of this, especially the runtime in 2023 in collaboration with our colleagues at Red Hat and other partners so keep your eyes open for that because we really see this as a progression to open source. Um, the last two charts that I'll show, this is the way we're thinking about how inner source affects our fundamental innovation funnel. So the way I think about innovation is it starts with one of two things. It either happens with a change in the marketplace, like a GDPR or a COVID-19, or there's some fundamental enhancement to science or technology that allows you to address old problems better. So an example of that one would be in, in 2001 when Apple saw the 1.8 inch hard drive, they realized that they could create a product that was much better than the Walkman for portable music, the iPod. The problem has always been though, is that it's very slow through this funnel. IBM research will work on something and then they create something interesting. But the joke I always tell is that the day the IBM press research press release goes out is the day that the product rewrite begins. And so it's a very slow path through the funnel and only into usually a single product. And because of that, by the time we actually get something to market, it's not differentiated. There's lots of people already there and maybe the original concept was lost along the way. So with InnerSource and the core tech stacks, what we do is we create an innovation funnel where the innovations from IBM Research, InnerSource, open source flows into these common components. 
And then the products, many products, not just IBM products, but also partner products now can adopt those components. And so the nice thing about that is when something new comes through, all of the people who have already adopted our components for them, it's just a software bump, which takes literally minutes rather than being like a six or six month project. So we're really both accelerating uh, the time to market for a particular innovation, as well as scaling the impact of a particular innovation into many products. Um, the last thing I'll say is that um, we are moving aggressively, not just from inner source, but also to open source. And this is one example. So if you've got an AI system running at internet scale, you've got something called model serving, which you can think of as like web serving for AI. Inside IBM, we had two redundant implementations. We were able to coalesce these into a common implementation in inner source, but then we worked with Red Hat to actually move that out to open source. And so now we're going to triple down on that model going forward. And our basic thought is, since inner source is derived by open source, to do inner source well, you're actually building the organizational capability to do open source well. So for any of our common AI components, they will all start off as inner source. But then with industry partners like Red Hat and a few others that will be announced next year, we'll basically move much of this technology into open source to create an even broader ecosystem. And then we'll continue to do inner source for whatever is next as extensions of that common open source. And so we're creating a kind of a reusable governance framework for when do we do common things in inner source and when do we do things in open source to seed an ecosystem. So I am being mindful of time. We're at 1230, so I'll stop this now, but I look forward to answering your questions both in the chat and during the Q&A after this.